about um, Houston, Texas, <clears throat> and somebody said, you know, that, that those were the first words, that was the first word ever uttered from the surface of the moon. Houston. Houston capital. I wrote. Houston, this is tranquility case, and that was the first word ever uttered from the moon. So just like that, we do something a little different. All right, uh, let's get started. My name is Will Summerhorn. Um, I am uh, now a county guy again. Uh, I've been a county guy for a long time, and I was in Salt Lake City for about six years, and now I'm back with the county, Salt Lake County, the director of regional planning and transportation there. And uh, uh, before that, like I say, six years of Salt Lake City as planning director. Before that, 27 years of Davis County. Um, holy smokes. That seems like forever. Hi. It feels like forever. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, glad to be here. I am also the legislative chair for the Utah chapter of the American Planning Association. And with that, since about, I don't know, 1990 or so, I've been uh, following and, you know, been one of the groupies for the state legislature. And uh, we'll, we'll do some legislative update a little bit later, but, you know, I, back then I kind of fell into this idea of thinking, we need to understand. How did we get the rules that we were kind of for planning? Um, and we need to make changes, and we did. We need to make some changes, and it seems like we're continually making changes. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as part of this. Um, planning, believe it or not, is part of politics. Uh, everybody, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people think, oh, you know, this is supposed to be really so objective and so on, but it's, it's politics. It's part of local government. Local government is politics. And, uh, for a lot of people, politics is a dirty word, but you know, there's stuff about it that you don't like so much. But it really is a, it's just it's a process of determining who gets what, and that's kind of what happens in land use. Is it kind of determine who gets what as far as what they want to see happen in development. So as I get started here, let me just tell you quickly. Uh, Brent Bateman, we're tag teaming this. So I'm doing the legislative part of this, he'll do the administrative part, and there's a very clear distinction there, and we'll talk about that. But my part probably isn't going to take that long, so I talked to Brent about swapping some time, probably need a little bit more time because the legislative update is only scheduled for about a half an hour. So um, I think we'll need a little more time than on the legislative update, so this is not so long for me. So we'll probably wrap up this part of the presentation about 10.30ish. And then we'll just launch into the legislative update. Following that, we will do the, the legal update. So just to give you a little bit of an idea where you're going. And I'm always good, you know, get to the point where you do a little bit of a break. I'm assuming Brent is too. Brent is all about people being comfortable and doing good stuff. So let's talk about what the role of the planning commission is and where it fits in into this whole process of everything. The state code says that every city and county must have a planning commission. They must. So what if you don't? Well, there's really no penalty in the code. Uh, but if you want to have anything at all to do with land use regulations, zoning, subdivision codes, anything like that, you have to have a planning commission. Because the state code requires that the planning commission plays a role in that. The county commission or the county council, whatever your form of government is, city council in the case of some of the folks that are here from Connect, they can't do anything with regard to land use regulations until they get a recommendation from the Planning Commission. It's required in the state code. Um, so there are, but there are some different roles to be played there, and sometimes people get those roles confused. Um, when I say sometimes, I should probably say a lot of times. The roles get confused, and people don't understand the different things that are happening and the different processes that you work under. So why do we have Planning Commissions? Where did this whole idea of Planning Commissions come from, and, and how did they become so integral to government, to local government? in our cities and our counties. The whole idea really got going back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s um, when there was a lot of distrust in government. You had, uh, in, in many of the bigger cities around the country, you had these machine politics going, you know, where you had a boss who kind of ran the political system in that community and he would drive people and provide benefits and things to like poor immigrants and other people and to get him to vote the way he wanted to. And they basically ran the, the government and the politics of those communities. Oh, and sure, the sure. citizens themselves maybe felt a little bit differently about something that didn't seem to matter much. Unless you could get the, the political boss to agree with you, 
didn't happen because they had a real iron grip on what happened in those communities through the political process at that time. And people began to lose trust in the government. <clears throat> you had kind of the same thing happening in many state legislatures. State legislatures were being captured by special interest groups. That doesn't happen today. <clears throat> but back in those days, you know, groups like the mining, timber, the railroads, uh, that was probably the most egregious example where uh, frequently the railroads, how they would essentially buy uh, the votes and the control that they wanted in state legislatures. And it all had to do oftentimes with the process for getting the, the people elected to the state legislature and things that they wanted to do. And it made people really distrustful of government. And so kind of began this era that a lot of people call the progressive era, um, the kind of a new new urbanist, not urbanist, but new kind of reform, uh, deal for government that kind of got going at the, in that period of time. And they saw a lot of things happen to change the way government worked. One of those things was um, many states passed, uh, and Utah was one of those, and included in the state constitution this process of referendum and issues, that the people themselves could decide on whether they liked the laws that their legislature or their local elected officials were passing if they didn't, they could collect signatures, get them on the ballot, get those laws overturned or changed, or they could even write their own laws and get them on the ballot. And this was all in response to that idea of we don't trust those guys in government because they too often seem to have been uh, beholden to some of these money interest groups. Um, so about this time, you had what was going on in city government as well with all the, the, the bad stuff that was happening, like the tenements that were developing in New York City, and uh, this whole movement towards improving the city, making it better, called the City Beautiful Movement. And many cities wound up forming what they call City Beautiful Commissions, uh, or committees, that would look at ways to how to improve the community and make it a more pleasant place and a better place to live. Well, that kind of, that idea picked up and in the 1920s, uh, the, there was a commission, a national commission, that looked at developing this, what they called the Standard Enabling Act, which was basically the framework for doing planning and zoning uh, in communities. The whole concept got started in 1916 in New York City. Uh, there were some Supreme Court cases in the 1920s uh, that really enshrined the process of, of land use regulation through planning and zoning. Um, and as part of that Standard Act, which in the end, Nearly every city or every state in the country adopted called for this process that included the planning commission. And that came out of this concept that you really can't trust those elected guys. We've got to have some citizens in this process that give them unbiased, objective opinions. Um, and maybe not give them the actual ability to govern directly, but to at least uh, make it so that they have to advise those elected officials and make it a little harder for those elected officials to maybe do whatever they felt like they wanted to do. And so that's where kind of the concept of planning commissions came in. And every one of those state enabling acts, uh, virtually every one of them included this provision of having planning commissions. Um, and so they play a very key role in the land use process um, right from the beginning and continue to. Um, and in some ways, um, it's really a way to get direct citizen involvement in what happens in, in local government. So what's the Planning Commission's role? The Planning Commission role has some very specific, or the Planning Commission has some very specific roles as outlined in the state code. They have the responsibility to prepare a general plan for the community. And then they recommend that to the governing body, to the elected officials. The Planning Commission doesn't adopt it directly for the community, they recommend it, but they have the role and responsibility to prepare that general plan, and they recommend it on to the elected officials. Then, following on to that plan, when you want to make it happen, you have all of those land use ordinances, zoning, subdivision ordinance, um, official maps, uh, and your zoning map that shows how your city is going to be zoned. Again, the Planning Commission has the responsibility to prepare that, to do it first, and then recommend it on to the elected officials. That's the direct responsibility that, that the Planning Commission has. Those are the direct responsibilities that are outlined in the state code. Then there's another responsibility that they have, and the way it's written in the state code now, and this has changed a little bit from what it was in the past. 
But what the state code says now is that the planning commission now also is to recommend to the elected officials um, the appropriate body to basically administer the code, to designate what they are, what's called the land use authority. And the land use authority is really the administrative part. You've gone through, you've done your general plan, you adopted, you've gone through and developed your, your zoning code, zoning ordinances, subdivision code, your zoning map, and recommended that on, and that's all been adopted now by the city council, by the county commission, the county governing body. And now you're, you're working under that. Well, in those processes, oftentimes people have to submit an application. And those applications have to go through a review process. And that review process is often done as you well know, in, by the Planning Commission. Well, in order to do that under the state code, the Planning Commission has to be designated as the Land Use Authority, but it doesn't have to be the Planning Commission. And that's why in the state code it says is that the Planning Commission has a duty to make a recommendation to the elected officials as to uh, what that Land Use Authority or who that Land Use Authority should be and how it works. Most communities, most counties in this state have designated their planning commissions to be the land use authority. Uh, they have to do that. If the city council doesn't designate the land use authority, then by default in the state code, it's the elected body. They're the land use authority. Now some elected bodies, they're just fine with doing that role, but a lot of them don't really want to do that because it's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of stuff that comes up with that, and so that's one of the, uh, the ideas behind having this uh, land use authority. Mostly it's the planning commission, but it doesn't have to be. It can be another body that, they, that is created specifically for that purpose. It can be an individual. Uh, in many communities now, all of that land use authority doesn't have to reside in one place. You can break it up into bits and pieces. And so you could give some of that administrative authority, say, to if you have a planner on staff at your community, designate that planner to handle certain kinds of applications and decide. Um, and so there's different ways you can do it, but that's one of those duties and responsibilities. And that's all the administrative function, and that's what Brent's going to talk about. That's why he needs more time to talk about it, because it is pretty complex or it can get complex, and there's a lot of variations about how to do that. The legislative function is pretty straightforward, and that's the recommending part, and that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about here as we go on. So enough about that administrative role. I'll let Brent talk about that. Let's talk about it. So the Planning Commission really can have two <coughs> different specific roles. One's legislative, and one's administrative. And those two processes really work in different ways and have different rules by which they go. So, what is a legislative action? And as I said, <coughs> this is really the area that's clearly outlined in the state code to say this is really, this is the definite responsibility of the planning commission. That can't be given away to anybody else. And that's the part of what this is. Legislative action is something that relates to the adoption of policy and the rules to implement those policies. These decisions are more political than they are legal. Aha, so if you're on the planning commission, you probably thought you weren't in politics, right? You are. You're part of the political process, part of the legislative process. And it's totally appropriate that you, that you are. The rub comes, and Brent will talk about this, and I, I don't think he's stealing the thunder from you. There's a big difference between a legislative action and an administrative action. And you'll see. <coughs> If these, kinds of, if these kind of legislative matters go to the courts, generally the courts will give broad deference to the community. So let's say you as a planning commission, and then ultimately your elected officials decide that you want to zone a piece of property a certain way, and the property owner or the neighbors decide they don't like that decision and they take it to court, the courts are generally going to say, you know what, that's really more of a political issue than it is a legal issue. And unless it does something that's clearly out of bounds, we're not going to get involved. That's something for those local officials and those people in that community to decide, not the courts. So as I say, these issues are more political than they are legal, and so the courts will give those kinds of decisions broad deference, or they're supposed to give them broad deference. Doesn't always happen, but usually it does. 
<laughs> As I say, these are only usually only challengeable in the courts if they are clearly illegal um, or have absolutely no public benefit. Now let me give you an idea of what's clearly illegal. It's clearly illegal under, say, our state and, and the federal constitution. Let's say you create a zone in your community and your zone says no minorities allowed to live in the zone. <laughs> clearly unconstitutional, illegal. Somebody could take that to court, even though it is a legislative action, but they could probably take that to court and say, you know, this really goes way out beyond what is allowable under our code of conduct and our code of rules, and we'd probably get kicked out. That's why I find this so interesting. Y'all heard about this referendum, and again, this is power of the people, that this is going on in California, that basically says, um, kill gay people. And I mean, it's, but it's working its way through the process. Um, but probably will not wind up being able to withstand those, those constitutional uh, requirements. So, that, these kinds of actions are usually only challengeable in that way. These actions are, you remember I talked at the beginning about this process of referendums and initiatives? These kinds of decisions are referable. What that means is your citizens can decide they don't like what you did. Collect signatures, get it on the ballot, and have a vote about it. So that would include Things like rezones, things like what your zoning ordinance says, even what your general plan says, things like that. These actions by state constitution and by a number of court decisions handed down since then are clearly referable. The citizens can take them to a vote and overturn the action that, uh, that the planning commission recommended and the governing body ultimately took. <clears throat> All right, what are the kinds of legislative actions that you as a planning commission do? The adoption, and then the subsequently the amendment of a general plan. That's a legislative action. It's a policy issue. We want our community to look like this. We want this to be over here, and we want that to be over there, and we want to create zones so these things are kind of sorted out. Um, but deciding on what that plan for your community is, that's a legislative action. It falls in that realm. The adoption or the amendment of any of your land use ordinances zoning ordinance or subdivision ordinance, uh, perhaps any other land use codes uh, or ordinances that you have, those are legislative. So when you create a zone, or when you say it is zone, we're going to allow for these things, uh, those are legislative. Those are policy issues. Those are very debatable issues and things that the people in the community talk about and decide that's what they want to do. And there's not clearly a right or wrong answer to these things at least on a legal basis, but it but it's, falls in that realm of legislative action. Zonings or rezonings of property. There was some question about that for a period of time here, whether, a re, whether zoning of property was a legislative or an administrative action. In some states, they are considered administrative actions because they're saying that you've got a general plan, the general plan says how your community is going to develop, and where things go and your zone is just a means of implementing that, of doing that administratively. But because of the way most places, and we do rezonings here where it's clearly a legislative act, your city council has to act upon it, it's, it's considered to be a legislative action. Um, so uh, be aware of that. Any annexations to a community are considered a legislative act. A community does not have to annex property into the community. It's a discretionary act. And, and it's something that, again, falls into the realm of do we want to grow, do we want to include? So it's a legislative action. On legislative actions, the Planning Commission makes no final decision. The Planning Commission only recommends to the elected officials. Okay? Your role is to be a recommender. But the interesting thing about this in the state code is that your elected officials cannot take any actions regarding these kinds of issues until they get a recommendation from the Planning Commission. <coughs> they have to get a recommendation from the Planning Commission first, and then they can act. The Planning Commission makes no final decision. That is something they only do um, as a role. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is the public's role is different when the Planning Commission is acting in their administrative role or their legislative role. And <clears throat> the public generally doesn't understand what that difference is. And a lot of people on Planning Commissions don't understand what that difference is. Um, and that it goes right to the heart of when you have public hearings or meetings where you have the public come 
all of your meetings by law have to be open to the public. But they, there's no guarantee that they um, can speak. There's nothing that would allow them to speak in your meetings. They can come, they can watch, and if you allow them to speak, they can speak. Uh, except for when there's a public hearing that's required. And at that point, the public has the right to speak. You can set some rules and parameters on how they do that, but they then have a right to speak when you're required to hold a public hearing. When you as a planning commission are doing a general plan or amending your general plan, before you make your recommendation in the state code, you're required to have a public hearing. So at that point, the public has the right to come in and talk to you about that general plan. Okay? Now, what happens is, People, when they come to a meeting, what are, what are most of your planning commission meetings taken up with? Is it doing a general plan or amending your zoning code? Is that what you spend most of your time doing? No, not us anyway. Yeah, probably not, right? Most of your time is probably doing things like reviewing subdivision plans, conditional uses, uh, site plans, you know, all of the various things that you got. Those are land use applications and they fall under the administrator realm. That's what you spend most of your time doing. But when you're making a recommendation on a rezone or a general plan or a change to your zoning code, those are administrative actions. You probably don't do that very much, but the public and even planning commission members, when they come in, they think that, you know, that people think they have a right to speak and they think they have a right to express their opinion. And that's true when you're doing an or a legislative act, but it's not so true when you're doing an administrative act because there's a whole different set of rules that governs when you're doing an administrative act. And so for us, it's kind of important or key to help the public to understand what the difference is in the role. Let me just say real quick in that summary of what the difference is. When you're doing a legislative action, opinion is king. People can express their opinion all day long. That's what it's all about. Getting opinion, getting ideas, getting thoughts of what people have. When you're doing an administrative action, it ain't about opinion anymore. It's now about facts. And can people express, or they can tell you what they think about it, but the planning commission is responsible, has the obligation then to decide that issue based on the rules that are in place. You're not changing the rules at that point. The rules are in place. And so you have to look at the facts. Um, and the public and a lot of planning commissioners don't understand that isn't the time for people to come in and start saying, you know, we really don't want that to be a commercial area. We don't want to have that kind of a commercial use next to those houses. Okay, that's great. That decision was made a while back when you adopted your general plan and your zoning code. Too late. Now we're working under this set of rules, which is tell us some reason why this application doesn't meet our rules. <coughs> And so that's the basic difference. So with that, Brent, I'm turning her over to you. So come on up. Oh, let me just say ultimately. So the ultimate decision, when you get to the end of the process, on the legislative, the ultimate end of the process could be a vote of the public, because they can do that referendum. On the administrative, the ultimate end is it being in the courts. And Brent will talk about that. Yes. <clears throat> is it legal, ethical, or even desirable? More than one planning commission in an area. Depends. If you're in Weber County, it's important to have more than one. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer, right, Charlie? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how that goes. It's, there's nothing unethical about it. Uh, it's really a matter of preference. Do you feel like, uh, you know, how are you going to organize it? Where are you going to put those planning commissions? I'm state code right now in counties. You're supposed to have one planning commission for your entire unincorporated area. But there is a provision in the state code that allows you to have what are called, they were called townships. Now they're going to be called planning advisory areas. Years ago, there was a provision in there that allowed counties to have what are called planning districts. That went away, and you could only have the one planning commission for the entire county. Then we got townships, and, uh, and now that's going away, and they're becoming planning advisory areas, so you can have more than one planning commission. Now, where this changes is you can have, you can have at any time more than one land use authority. You can have several land use authorities. Land use authority and planning commission are not necessarily the same thing. They often are the same thing, but they don't have to be the same. You can have a whole separate body or a person that can be your land use authority that makes the decision on these administrative actions that Brett's going to talk about. But your planning commission, 
You have to have a planning commission that has that statutory responsibility for doing those legislative things. And then if the council decides, they can give them the authority to do the administrative stuff, which is what a land use authority is. So with that, I just confused you all, right? No, I have another question. The commission, they're both just advisory. Yes, planning commissions are, they're in their legislative role, are only advisory. That's correct. Yes, question. Legislator's question. Can you touch on the relationship between county staff and the appointed planning commission versus, you, you say we make recommendation to the uh, elected officials, but are we all working as a team with the staff, as a staff, a commission me committee member? I certainly hope you're working as a team. And here's why. The planning commission has the statutory responsibility. But many of you as planning commissioners, you don't have the time nor the expertise to do the kinds of things that are required. So your county or your local government will hire a planner to help you. And that's what their role and responsibility is, is to help you. To help you create the plan, to help you create the land use ordinances, and then to help get those land use ordinances administered. Uh, I don't know if I want to throw this in and use the issue. It is possible, because you can designate land use authorities to be an individual. The governing body could say, all right, this planner we hired, this full-time staff on our can also be a land use authority for certain kinds of decisions. So in that case, they would have direct responsibility. But generally, they're supposed to be helping you as planning commissioner and the elected officials to do those planning things, plan, do the general plan, do land use ordinances, and then the Great questions. Is there any, are there any more right now? <laughs> John? You're going to ask a question you know the answer to already. Right? Right. Right. So back to legislative motions, uh, which we didn't talk about too much, but if the public on an application is an opinion in a, in a uh, pre zone that everybody in that audience says, we don't like this thing, can you include that in the motion? Can you include in the motion what? That, that no public hated this idea? Nobody likes it. Everybody that showed up said no. It's a bad idea. I don't know any reason why not. Action. It's a legislative act. Sure. Okay. And with the legislative act, you don't need much of a reason to decide. And if your reason is the public hates this, that's a perfectly valid reason for the courts will hold. Now, it's for additional use. It's yeah. a different matter. I'm talking about that. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. All right. I'm Brent Damon. I'm the lead attorney in the Office of the Property Rights and Ombudsman. If any of you wonder what I do for a living, you're not the only one. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about that any time, but I've got, to, I've got to start by doing something that violates the very principles of my soul. As an attorney, this is just, I have to do something that I just hate, hate doing. I agree 100% with everything Will said. <laughs> that was tough. Every fiber of my attorney's soul tells me to never, ever agree with what people say. But Will it was correct in everything he said, and he did a great job. And we're kind of tag teaming this, so you consider what he said and I said to kind of, to kind of go together. I'm here to talk about the administrative role. Now, I have a question for you. And let's try a little experiment today. I find that whenever I, uh, uh, a speaker or someone asks a question, I don't answer because I don't want to get the question wrong. So we're going to try an experiment today. Uh, I want you to purposefully answer any question I ask today wrong. Okay? That way, when you answer wrong, you look like a genius. Okay? Here's my question. Okay? We'll talk about the two roles for the planning commission. Okay? The legislative role and the administrative role. Okay? Which of those two roles is the most important role? <laughs> You're wrong! Good job! <laughs> well done. That's because the rules have already been set. Well, that's right. See, here's the thing, okay? Um, I've, I've had this discussion with a lot of folks. I've had this discussion with a lot of you, okay? And one thing that, that keeps people keep saying to me is, okay, I thought my job was to decide condition use permits as a planning commissioner. I thought that was my job. I thought that's why I was there, okay? You're telling me that that's not the important part of my job. And that really isn't even part of my job. That just happens to be part of my job because the the, uh, the county commission 
gave me that authority, said I'm my language authority, but that's not really what my job's supposed to be. And that's correct. So what am I supposed to do? I'm wasting my time, you know? Because that's my job, and you're telling me that's not my job. Well, it is your job if, if you're given that responsibility, okay? But what the statute says is that your job is legislative. Your job as a planning commissioner is to plan. Right? It's called a planning commissioner. It's not, you know, called a conditional use commission, commissioner. Right? It's called a planning commissioner because your job is to plan. That legislative role is critical. Okay? The, the county commission, the city council, they have a lot to do and they have a lot to worry about. And land use is only a little part of it. But land use is a hugely important part of it. It is so important that they create a planning commission to help them. And it's so important that they won't let the commission make a decision without a planning commission recommendation. You have to have one. That's how critical it is. So, yeah, okay, planning doesn't take as much time and doesn't take as much effort as, as you know, the administrative roles, you know, commission uses, stuff like that. But it's the most important job. And if you ever find yourself in the planning commission or a staff who help you in the planning commission, if you ever find yourself having to make a choice for your time between the planning role, between you know, working on amending ordinances or, or drafting the ordinances or, or, or amending the general plan or making recommendations, and the administrative role, doing conditional use permits, you need to work on the planning part. That's the part that's most important, okay, the, the legislative part. Now, having said that, it's not illegitimate at all to do the administrative part. And we're going to talk about the administrative part. But you just need to know that the planning commission's job is to plan. That's their role. Would you say, would you, would you agree with that, Will? Am I hitting that on the head? Okay, now we need to talk about the administrative role. Now, <clears throat> I find that the easiest way to think about this, here's the thing about this. A lot of people, including some very advanced attorneys that I know, think this is kind of a, a confusing thing. And it, I don't think it's all that tough. Um, and it's not because I'm any smarter than that. Most of the, I'm dumber than all, almost all of them. But, um, but I think people tend to overthink this, okay? Now, back to high school civics class, okay? The three forms of government, the three branches of government, where are they? Executive, that's, that's vested in the president, right? And all of his people, right? Legislative, that's Congress, you know, the House of Representatives, the Senate. Judicial, that's the Supreme Court, right? And all the courts, okay? So what are their job? What's the legislative branch? What's Congress's job? Make, Make laws. laws, okay? Their job is to turn policy into laws. Their job is to talk about, this is how we want our society to function. Okay. So let's make laws in order to, you know, sort of standardize that and make sure everyone knows what we expect of them, right? And we'll, our, our society will function that way. So they take policy and they turn it into law. Okay, what's the executive branch's job? To veto. To veto. <laughs> the executive branch's job is to enforce, right? Their job is to take the laws that Congress makes, okay? and make it happen, enforce it, make sure that everyone follows it, right? Um, and you know, I'm, every time I say this, I get some people looking at me like, you know all that our executive branch isn't doing that now, right? But that's, that's you know, you can, you can argue about that all day. And the judicial branch's job is what? To interpret. To interpret, that's right, because we have a law, okay, and you have to apply the law to different scenarios Okay? How does that apply? You know, we don't, our law maybe doesn't anticipate every possible scenario. So we have to take the scenario and we have to apply it. And we have to interpret it. And that's what the judicial branch's job is. Okay? Now, that's, we have that uh, set up in our federal government. We have that set up in our state government. The exact same setup. Okay? Do you have the exact same setup in the counties, in your local government? Pretty much. Pretty much, not exactly, but pretty much. Okay, who has the legislative job? County commissioners. The county commissioners has the, have the legislative job. Who else has the legislative job? The planning commission has a legislative role, right? But does the planning commission make legislative decisions? Never, never. The county the county commission always makes a legislative decisions. They're the only one with authority 
to take that policy and make law. Planning Commission's officer recommend, right? And planning commission or the, the county commission decide. Who has the administrative function? Who has the administrative function? This is the tricky one. This is where it gets a little bit different from our regular forms of government. The land use authority. The land use authority. That means that whoever has the administrative function is whoever the county commission designates to have that. Right? Who has the quasi who has the quasi judicial function? I have to say quasi judicial because they're not like county judges. But there is a process by which decisions are interpreted and can be appealed and stuff like that. Right? Who has that? Who? The Board of Adjustment, okay? Um, or whoever the appeal authority is supposed to be. The actual term in the, in the statute now is appeal authority. There used to be a requirement for a Board of Adjustment. There isn't any more. So really, the quasi-judicial, the judicial decisions, the interpreted part, is also whoever the, the county commission designates. The county commission designates uh, administrative authority, uh, land use authority, the county commission designates appeal authority. Okay? And it can be anybody. There's no requirement that it be someplace. Most places, this is a um, board of adjustment. Most places, this is the planning commission. That's okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you're a planning commissioner, okay? And you sit down at a planning commission meeting, and somebody comes to you with an application, okay? The first thing you should always do, the first thing you should always do, is you should think about what kind of decision this is. Always. What kind of decision this is? Okay. Why? Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm not going to ask the answer. We're going to talk about that. We should always know exactly what kind of decision this is. Is this a legislative decision or an administrative decision? Hopefully, if they're a field authority, if they're based on judicial decisions, they're not coming to planning decision. Okay. What kind of decision is it? So somebody comes to you and says, "I want, uh, I want to build a uh, grocery store, uh, but I'm in a residential area." So I want to apply to build a grocery store in my residential area. Okay? What do I need? A zone change. Okay? So they come to you and they ask for a zone change. What is it? It's a legislative decision. Why? Because of change between the zoning now. Because you're changing the law. Okay, you're changing the law. You're changing the zoning ordinances. You're changing the law. You're making an amendment. Somebody comes to you and says, uh, okay, I don't need a zone change, but I just want to build a prison in my area. It never happens. Okay. And prisons just so happen are a conditional use in my area. So I want a conditional use permit to build a prison. What kind of decision do we have? Administrative decision. Why? Because you already know the law. The law says that prisons are a conditional use. So you're taking that application and you're applying it to the law. Okay. It's an administrative decision. Okay. Legislative decisions make law. They make law. That includes, like Will said, annexations. That includes zoning changes or amendments. That includes the plan, amendments to the plan. Anything that makes law. Anything that applies to a big group of people or applies to everybody in general. It's a legislative decision, right? Administrative decision applies the law that's already in place. It doesn't require a law change, okay? It takes one application and tries to fit it into a law. Okay? So, why is it important that we know which one it is right up front? Why? There's several reasons, and it's impossible to get this one wrong, so I'm for, sorry, all of you are going to be disappointed. But there's several reasons. Why is it important to know that up front? Because it is, it's critical. Legislative decisions, and that states county or county or city wide. That's right. Or at least however big that zone is that it applies to, or whatever. Right. Somebody comes to you with an application, a particular application, though. Okay. And you have to ask yourself. You say, because Brent told us to ask ourselves right up front, is this legislative administrative decision? You have to ask yourself that. Okay. And then you you you, you take the advice that we received here, and you say. Okay, this applies countywide, and this doesn't apply countywide. So that's how you know 
that's the first state of administrative decision, okay? Then what? Why is that important to know? Is the, is the process any different after that? Once you know the difference? What's that? You have a lot more discretion with the legislative decision that is absolutely correct, and that's a, that's a hugely important thing, reason why you need to know. You need to know how much discretion you have. Discretion is my ability to make this decision, right? What I have to base it on, okay? Um, because, you know, you're gonna, people are going to come, they're going to ask you things, and they're going to give you reasons, and you have to be able to say, that's good enough reason, or that's not a good enough reason, right? You have to be able to say that every time you make that decision, okay? So, how do you know if it's a good enough reason, okay? This is, I'm going to talk about that right now. This is one of the reasons why you need to know, okay? There are two different standards of review for a legislative and administrative decision. They're very different, okay? Both of them are, uh, they're reviewed on the basis of whether or not the decision was arbitrary, capricious, and illegal. If you make a decision and somebody says, you make the wrong decision, in order to prove that you made the wrong decision, they have to prove that your decision was arbitrary, capricious, and illegal. Okay? If it's illegal, that means it violates some law. That's fine. That's easy. All they got to do is show you a law that your decision violates. Okay? And that includes your local ordinance. The question becomes, is it arbitrary, capricious? And that's what you'll hear a lot. You'll hear people say, that decision was arbitrary. That decision was capricious. What in the world does that word even mean? I do not know. Okay. Oh, making a capricious decision. Shame on you. Here's how you know. Okay. You have to decide if it's arbitrary, capricious, and illegal. If it's a legislative decision, okay, it is not arbitrary or capricious if it is reasonably debatable that the ordinance is in the interest of the general welfare. Reasonably debatable. Think about that. What does that mean? I mean, we'll touch on this a little bit. We, we had a question that addressed this. If it's reasonably debatable that it's in the interest of the general welfare, we will uphold it. How do you get to that? Reasonably debatable. That means that if I could look you in the eye and say, I think this is a good decision, I win. That's it. That doesn't take very much, right? Okay, does that mean then that the, uh, the decision could be because so many people showed up at county commission meet, at county commission meeting or the county council meeting? So many people showed up and didn't like it? Even though their, their reasons for not liking it are completely irrational, even though their, their facts that they gave you for why they didn't like it are completely wrong, just that they didn't like it? Is it reasonably debatable that the fact that they didn't like it is that reasonably debatable? That that's what's best for the community? Sure it is. Sure it is. It doesn't take much. I mean, it's just that's just tiny. That standard is so low that we don't know of any case in the United States of America that's of a legislative decision based on that standard that's ever been overturned. It certainly hasn't ever been one in Utah. There's been legislative decisions overturned because they were illegal. But never because they're arbitrary capricious, because reasonably available is so low a standard. Now, yes, I am telling you that you are very, very powerful. I can see some of you going like this. <laughs> <laughs> that means I can do anything I want. And you know what? To some extent that that's true. Okay? Because remember, the legislative decision is where you're deciding what you want in your community. You're 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 um, codifying policy. You're saying, this is our community, this is how we run things here. They elected me so that I would make things this way. This is what I think is best. So I'm going to 